From year to year, the economy fluctuates around its long run trend value and does so as demand shocks and supply shocks buffet the economy, causes it to go into recessions and into booms. But that's not the end of the story. GDP is going to continue to change depending on what is happening in the factor markets, the markets for the factors of production that are inputs into the goods and services being produced. So for example, suppose the economy is currently in a boom, that is, is producing above its normal capacity because it's uh, an economy in which the tourism sector is large and there is an influx of tourists. They're having a good tourist season. And so the economy has expanded. Where it is producing, output is above the full employment level and firms are competing for workers with other firms in the same industry, in the tourist industry perhaps, and with businesses in other industries entirely. So there's tightness in the labor market. If we're above the full employment level of output, then that tells you that there is excess demand for labor. We know therefore that over time, wages are going to be rising. And as wages rise, that pushes up the cost of production. We show that as the aggregate supply curve shifting upwards. When that is happening, then because costs are rising, then the prices of goods and services are going to be rising along with it. Cost prices are pushing up product prices. And as product prices go up, then aggregate demand is going to respond to the higher prices of domestic goods and services by reducing the amount of goods and services being demanded. So we move along the aggregate demand curve to a new equilibrium. We move back to the economy's normal capacity because costs are going to keep rising and prices are going to keep rising and aggregate demand is going to keep falling until we get to the economy's full employment level of output. And that represents the long run equilibrium. That's an example of positive demand shock. Let us look at what happens if the economy has suffered a negative supply shock. Let us say it's an oil dependent economy and there has been a rise in oil prices, in world oil prices, and so the cost of energy in this economy has gone up. And that higher cost of energy and therefore the higher cost of production and goods and services prices means that aggregate demand has slumped. So the economy is producing less than its full employment level of output, less than its normal capacity. At which point production has fallen and workers have been laid off. So we have, we have unemployment, we have cyclical unemployment. The demand for labor is less than the available supply of labor. That means as the economy evolves, that slackness in the labor market and unemployment is going to be pushing real wages down. And therefore the cost of production is going to fall. The aggregate supply curve shifts downwards to represent it. And that is going to continue until that unemployment has closed up and the economy reverts eventually to the full employment level of output where wages have fallen and GDP has expanded to get back to its long run equilibrium. The economy, however, can get stuck in a recession for a long time. That gap between an economy's current level of output in a recession and its full employment level of output is called an output gap. So an output gap can last a long time. 
because the labor market adjusts slowly and especially if the adjustment requires real wages to fall then that can take place very slowly because real wages can get stopped for a long period of time above the level that would clear the labor market you can't miss say that wages are sticky because wages are sticky downwards that output gap can persist for a long time and it can create social problems with excess unemployment for a fairly long period of time and to be honest it can also create political problems for a government so there is a temptation to use policy to solve the problem well there are ways that governments can intervene it can use fiscal policy fiscal policy can be used by cutting taxes which leaves households with more disposable income and that's going to push up their consumption spending and the government can itself increase its own spending its own demand for the economy's goods and services and so in that way the government can try to increase aggregate demand the central bank can get into the act as well the monetary authority can pursue an expansionary monetary policy which means that they try to push reserves into the banking system so the banks have a greater capacity to lend and with more lending capacity then interest rates are going to fall and that's going to stimulate the demand for investment goods so fiscal policy and monetary policy can be used to try to nudge the aggregate demand curve to the right in an attempt to close the output gap instead of waiting for the much longer period of time it might take for real wages to fall and for the output gap to close naturally failing expansionary fiscal policy then you just have to wait for however long it takes and however gradually rail wages fall and the output gap is closed on its own the covid-19 pandemic presents not only a great example but an example of significant magnitude in which these policies were on display the measures to manage the pandemic isolation quarantines curfews lockdowns reduce the opportunities for households to spend further the loss of revenue by businesses led to layoffs and laid off workers had less income and that further reduced consumption spending so what did that look like on our model of of the aggregate economy so disposable income fell and so consumption spending fell and the aggregate demand curve shifted to the left this was the macroeconomic consequence of the management of the pandemic output fell significantly in in in, in many economies what did the governments do well government started issuing cash transfers to individuals and to businesses they started throwing cash out their windows as as quickly as they could in significant amounts in the rich countries for which we have a lot of the data altogether they effected fiscal stimulus that was upwards of 4 trillion us dollars worth and their fiscal deficits their excess of spending over revenue ballooned to 17% of gdp 
Now, generally, fiscal deficits are somewhere between uh, zero and maybe four percent of GDP. So this was this was an exercise in huge fiscal stimulation. At the same time, they were cutting taxes in some countries, all in, all in an attempt to increase consumption spending. And then the central banks also got into the act. At the same time as the governments were giving cash transfers, cutting taxes, increasing their own expenditure to push up the consumption and fiscal and government spending components of aggregate demand, the central banks got into the act by massively expansionary fiscal policy, pumping as much liquidity into the economies as they could to bring interest rates down. Again, all of that was for the purpose of shoring up investment spending. So with all of that taken together, the purpose was to attempt to mitigate what would otherwise have been a sharp and massive reduction in aggregate demand. And it was successful. The reduction in aggregate demand coming from the economy's initial starting point pre-COVID was much less than it otherwise would have been if not for the exercise of expansions of fiscal and monetary policy to mitigate the impact, the contraction of the pandemic. Notwithstanding that great effort, it did not compensate fully for the contraction of consumer and business spending caused by the pandemic. And so the economy still went into the largest recession that these economies had seen probably since you know, the Second World War. The evidence that we have that this is what was on the way comes from looking at fall in in real wages remember that the height of the aggregate supply curve represents the cost structure of the economy largely the cost of labor and the cost of imported inputs for that output gap to close and so the pandemic uh, induced recession to recede, wages have to fall. Given that the governments and central banks' expansionary policies, as successful as they were, were insufficient to entirely close the fiscal gap, real wages had to fall so that the economy could fully recover from the pandemic recession. And indeed, wages and prices did fall. In the United States, from where we have data, prices tumbled as the coronavirus lockdown dragged on and people spent less. Since in the face of demand shocks or supply shocks, and even a worldwide pandemic, economies seem to revert in the long run to their full employment levels of output. It does raise the question, it's all about the full employment level of output. So what determines where that is? And how can we get that to increase? Well, we're talking here about fluctuations around the trend or full employment level of output. If we want to talk about what causes the full employment level of output to increase over time, the economy's capacity to produce to increase over time, then that is the subject of a different discussion. That is the subject of economic growth. That is due to getting the economy to have a larger capital stock, more productive technology of production, and more facilitating institutions of commerce, each and all of which will allow the existing labor force 
to be more productive. So that one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of labor that you need to produce any given level of output means that each amount of labor is more productive and, and can, can produce a larger volume of output. And so the amount of employment that makes up full employment will remain the same, but the level of output associated with full employment will be greater. Our takeaway from this is that an economy eventually reverts to the level of output consistent with normal capacity or full employment. <laughs>